meeting, but many blessings. It could be a wonderful, positive day, I know. An astrologer from Calgary, of all places, while I was a minister in Oregon, told me that I had been through a challenging life because the world was about to go through the same challenges and it helped to have people who had been through it to hold a high watch, I guess, you know? And I think that's true of every single person in this room at this moment. I truly do believe that we are here to hold a high watch. And that requires not getting perhaps as, as engaged as we would like to, as our, as our ego mind would like us to, but being able to stand back a little bit and look at what is truly happening and how we can help at that level. So it might be worthwhile to take a few moments in this early time of the new year and appreciate the amazing ways in which the, our expanded spiritual consciousness is already affecting us, is already expressing in our lives. Sometimes we get so engaged in the challenges and the, the, the opposition we encounter on a daily basis that we forget to notice that things are really improving greatly. We are much further along our path than we ever imagined we would be not so long ago, right? Uh, with all kinds of, with the Reiki, with the beautiful meditation, with the amazing music, with all the input, we realize that we're lifted to a higher level. That music does not just sit there and play, sound good. It lifts us to a higher level. You can feel it. And the same is true of meditation and all the techniques and tools that we've given ourselves that we, to um, help us along the way. And yet, as Marianne Williamson writes in her book, The Gift of Change, just when, we, just when love seemed to be the hot new topic, hatred rears its ugly head. And it's to be expected, of course, the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. But that's also, and this hadn't occur occurred to me before, uh, this week when I was preparing, that's also true in the opposite. The darker the shadow, the brighter the light. So when, when we're looking at dark shadows, it's good to remember that there's a bright, bright light somewhere available to us to dissolve those shadows. And so today we find ourselves caught up in dramas of, of anxiety and uncertainty. And they're subtler and more disturbing than the ones we dealt with on our own path getting us this far. And this is why it's more important than ever that we realize that we're, not, we're facing nothing new. That the same principles that have brought us this far are the principles that will carry us forward from here. The question then is, what, are, what did we do? What did we do that worked well enough that we are sitting here this morning together in community? Well, first, we recognize the problem. We, com we committed to a belief that we, I'm sorry, we admitted to a belief that we lack the personal power to solve our own problems. And surrendered our secondary belief that our inability made us um, failures in the eyes of God. Second, we joined together in community and spoke openly, shared openly. <coughs> Having set aside our pretense of being strong and self-sufficient, we found our true, infinite, inner strength where two or more are gathered. And third, we consciously applied spiritual principle to every challenge. And by so doing, we reconnected ourselves with the true spiritual identity that we came in with and with our spiritual purpose. We become the creators we had come here in human form to be. Now, it's more difficult to apply the same principles to a larger picture when we are less in physically involved in it, but the entwined dramas 
of this particular time, I think, offer a fine and challenging example. We make choices between beliefs, between attitudes of fear or stewardship. And at the same time, there's a sense that no administration, no Congress, no amount of money, no quick fix holds the answers to the challenges that we face. The truth is, the human systems and constructs we have so painstakingly fashioned are meant to deal with problems from the past and challenges that no longer apply. The health system, the education system, the economic system, the politics, the political system, they're all vestiges of the past that we are trying to prop up with our spiritual principles of now. And that's where we're running into, I think, some frustration. We can't fix the systems. We can, in fact, admit that we are powerless over those systems and turn and see if there is something else that we can focus on. Perhaps some of you recognize the first of the 12 steps in a lot of what I've been saying. More than 40 years ago, I was first introduced excuse me, to that step in my own life. Now, I would have said at the time, and for many months, perhaps years afterward, that it was not working and would not work for me. Sometimes I could see that it was working in other people, but I didn't believe that, I could, that it could also work in me. And yet here I am, 44 years later, still trying my best to follow those steps and constantly astounded at where that path has led me. It led me first to community, to a place where I could openly acknowledge my fears, my addictive thoughts, my limited abilities, not to professional authorities who could fix me, but to brothers and sisters on the path with me who knew and shared and believed when I could not. And it led my agnostic ex-Catholic self, angry at the judgments of religion that seemed to exclude and condemn my very nature, to a spiritual path that affirms my worth and supports my imperfect attempts to express the Christ nature that is my true identity. And looking back, I've been writing an article for the um, March, April, I think it is, Unity Magazine. I get so confused because they're so far ahead, I get to where I am. But looking at, remembering walking into Unity for the first time. The first time was in New York with Eric Butterworth, and that frightened me so much that I stayed away for five years. <laughs> By that time I was in Chicago, and I wasn't in need so much as I was beginning to feel limited in my own life. I had a lot of what I thought I wanted. I was professionally directing, choosing. I didn't have to take every job that came along. I could pick and choose, and that was always my goal. And yet, and yet, something didn't seem to click. I picked up the phone. I looked up the, looked in the yellow pages, picked up the phone, called Unity in Chicago, got the Reverend Mike Latoyne, who was just this amazing force of nature. He did his Sunday services in, in sweats, just to emphasize, yeah, just to emphasize that we don't do church, you know. Uh, but the sweats became almost as much of a uniform as a coat and tie would. And I tried to sneak in, I tried to be there without quite being there. You know, being there but observing. Uh, and that didn't, and in the face of Mike's energy, that didn't last very long. Recognizing an insufficiency, sharing the challenges of changing our perceptions and applying spiritual principle instead of knowing what we know. These are the tools that have carried us this far, and these are the tools that must become our unique contribution to the life situation in which we are such an important part. Marianne Williamson again. 
Our secret desire is to penetrate the veil between the world we live in and the world of something much more real. If the world we live in isn't as, it, as real as it's cracked up to be, and the world we want is on the other side of the veil, then where does that leave us? This is not an end time, she writes, but a new beginning. What is being born is the next stage of human evolution, played out dramatically in each of our lives. And that's the message of Barbara Marx Hubbard, of Jean Houston, of so many of the people that, that have affected my life in one way or another. Uh, there's no turning back. That's what this all means. There's no turning back. We don't accomplish anything by trying to get back to a, a, a past which we imagined was better than today. We are here to move forward. We are here always to grow. It is useless to return to a time when things seemed to be working. First of all, they weren't working as well as we remember, right? Uh, our dissatisfaction cannot be assuaged by finding a way back to what was. We're called to step into an unknown world of new possibilities. We stand at the turning point. And in another phrase that will sound familiar to some of you, half measures avail us nothing. Most of us have traveled thus far on our spiritual journeys, impelled by personal needs, personal challenges, personal desires for a better life. This is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. We have to want the kingdom of heaven for ourselves more than we want any of the distractions we encounter along the way. So we don't practice our spiritual principles out of a sense of obligation or because we hope to find favor in the anthropomorphic eyes of a distant God. We practice them so that we can move forward every day. We practice them because they work. And we look for and explore and learn from anything that helps us make those choices in conscious connection to our spiritual truth. We begin by embracing what each day offers, not by complaining about what each day demands. Using the Course in Miracles terminology that is so familiar to her, Mary Ann writes, the present is holy ground, the only place where eternity meets linear time. In this holy instant, we can break the chain of yesterday's thought, reprogramming the future by thinking different thoughts today. Reprogramming the future by thinking different thoughts today. Today's reality reflects yesterday's thinking. If we change our thoughts today, then tomorrow will be different. I love that. It sounds perhaps disturbingly simple, but it's absolutely true. If we change our thoughts today, then tomorrow will be different. And the question, I think, is do you really want to be looking back on today, on this time of your life, years from now, and wishing that you had appreciated it more deeply at the time? Or shall we use what we've learned to take the time to, to shift the focus so that we get every ounce of good out of today as we live it? So your assignment for this week is to live each day so fully, so richly, so lovingly that when you look back on it as, as you close your eyes at night, there will be no missed opportunities to regret. You may say that won't solve problems, and maybe it won't. But it will create an energy in which our problems will solve themselves. <laughs> we don't have to solve the problems. We can't solve the problems. The problems are the residue of yesterday's thinking. If we look ahead and think for today and carry that into tomorrow, the problems will solve themselves. They, they, will, they will have to. We stand amazed, and with good reason, that we have come this far and that we are where we are today. How much more amazing is it to know that everything has been prologue to this moment, 
that everything we thought we were doing for ourselves, we were really doing to change the world. Mm -hmm. To change the world. We come together each Sunday to change the world by our thoughts, by thinking thoughts today that are different from the yesterday's thoughts, by allowing today's positive energy to become tomorrow's life experience. That's what we're called to do. And that's what we are doing in so many ways in our own lives. It's time to realize that we're here for something even more than that. We're here literally to change the world. Blessings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.